to the local agency formation commission of Santa Cruz County meeting of Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021. Um, first item on our agenda is the roll call. And so I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Yes, thank you so much, Chair Justin Cummings. Good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday. And uh, roll call is beginning. Chairperson Justin Cummings. Here. Vice Chair Rochelle Lather. Here. Commissioner Jim Anderson. Here. Commissioner Roger Anderson. Here, George. Good, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm here. Commissioner. Excellent. And Commissioner Ryan Coonerty. Here. Commissioner Francisco Estrada. Good morning, everyone here. Commissioner Zach Friend. Welcome, Mr. Carpenter. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Ed Banks. Here. Commissioner Yvette Brooks. Good morning here. Good morning. Commissioner John Hunt. I am here, thank you. Good morning. Oh, good morning, John. And Commissioner Manu Koenig, uh, I believe is not in attendance today. Uh, you're correct, Chris. He... But for the record, we have a quorum. Perfect. All right, thank you very much. Um, at this moment, I'd like to ask the executive officer to summarize the virtual meeting protocol and introduce new commissioners. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just briefly, I wanted to um, remind the Commission and our guests that we are conducting this meeting uh, through Zoom webinar. Uh, this allows the Commissioners uh, complete control of their webcams and microphones. Uh, at the same time, members of the public, uh, your microphones and webcams have been disabled. However, uh, you will still be able to see and view not only staff's presentation, but the entire meeting and the Commission's discussion. For those individuals that would like to speak on behalf of any agenda item today, uh, there's two methods of doing so. One, you can email your comments to LAFCO and LAFCO staff will read your comments on your behalf. Or two, you can raise your hand uh, during public comments on that particular item. Uh, you can raise your hand by pressing the uh, hand button on Zoom, or if you're joining us via conference call, if you press star nine, your hand will be raised. Uh, you will be uh, acknowledged and at that point, you'll have up to three minutes to address the commission on that particular item. The commission clerk will inform you when you have one minute left and will inform you when your time is up. At that time, we would ask you to wrap up your comments. Uh, and for any commission action, there will be a roll call vote for full transparency and for the records. And chair, that concludes uh, my update. This is an informational item. No commission action is needed at this time. Great, thank you. And uh, I'd also like to uh, remind commissioners that if you'd like to comment on any item, please use the raise hand um, button that's um, on your dashboard for Zoom and you'll be called in the order of which uh, your hands were raised. Right. Uh, next item on our agenda uh, is the adoption of the minutes. So I'd like to uh, ask if any commissioners have any questions or edits to the minutes from the February 3rd, 2021 regular LAFCO meeting. Okay, hearing no questions or edits to the minutes, I'd like to ask for a motion on the staff's recommendations for the minutes from the meeting of February 3rd, 2021. That's so moved, Coonerty. Okay, so a motion by Commissioner Coonerty. Do we have a second? Oh, okay, I think that was a second by Commissioner Lather. So we have a motion by uh, Commissioner Coonerty, seconded by Commissioner Lather. Uh, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll call vote if there's no further discussion. Yes, thank you, Chairperson Justin Cummings. Chairperson Justin Cummings. Aye. Vice Chair Rochelle Lather. Aye. Commissioner Jim Anderson. Aye. 
Commissioner Roger Anderson. Aye. Commissioner Ryan Coonerty. Aye. Commissioner Francisco Estrada. Aye. Commissioner Zach Fran. Aye. For the record, this item passes unanimously. Great, thank you. Uh, next item on our agenda is oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public to address the commission on items that are not on our agenda. Um, I'd like to ask the executive officer if staff has received any written comments or, requ or, or requests to address the commission on non-agendized items. Thank you, Chair. At this time, we have not received any requests via email or uh, on Zoom requesting to speak to the commission on non-agenda items. So no one has uh, indicated they'd like to speak. Okay, thank you very much. Next item on our agenda is public hearings. Public hearing, uh, these are items that require expanded public notification per provisions of the state law uh, directives of the commission. First item on our public hearing agenda is Atkinson Lane, Brewington Avenue Extraterritorial Service Agreement. And so the commission will consider the extraterritorial service request to receive water and sewer service from the city of Watsonville under GCS 56133B. And so with, at this moment, I'll turn it over to staff for the presentation. Thank you, Chair. This proposal uh, involves the city of Watsonville and a single landowner. And if we zoom in, the subject area is approximately 14 acres and is owned by Midpen Housing. And if we zoom in a little bit more, as a map on the screen shows, the single parcel is just outside the city limits of Watsonville. The, the subject parcel is shown in red and the city limits is shown in green. However, this proposal area is within the city's sphere of influence. A complete analysis of this proposal is available in the staff report, uh, but for discussion purposes, I can summarize our findings in three points. First, the purpose of this application is to provide water and sewer towards a proposed 80 unit affordable housing project. The landowner is requesting an extraterritorial service agreement with the city with a subsequent annexation to occur after the completion of the development. Some of our commissioners may be wondering, uh, or may sound, this proposal may sound familiar. Uh, and that's because a similar two-part process occurred back in 2014 involving Midpen Housing and the city of Watsonville. After the extraterritorial service agreement was approved, phase one of the developments were eventually annexed into the city in 2018. And this proposal is Midpen Housing's phase two of these affordable housing project. Since the proposal area is within the city's sphere of influence, state law allows an extraterritorial service agreement to occur as a precursor to annexation. Based on staff's analysis, the proposal fulfills the legal requirements under government code 56133 and also uh, addresses the commission's requirements under the extraterritorial service agreement policy uh, that has been adopted. That is why staff is recommending that the commission adopt the resolution approving the extraterritorial service agreement with the condition that the area be annexed within one year of the final occupancy of the entire development. This condition was vetted with the city as well as the applicant. The entire resolution was reviewed by our legal counsel and staff feels confident uh, with our recommendation. But with that, staff is, uh, Happy to answer any questions and chair that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions after you open and close public comments. Great, thank you. Uh, before we go on to public comment, are there any, um, we're actually at this moment, moment in time, what I'll do is I'll open it up to public comment and then bring it back for any questions, action and deliberation by the commission. Um, and so it seems like we have one um, member of the public who's raised their hand to comment. Um, and yes, I'll turn it over to the, uh, to the clerk to call on that individual, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, um, so this, you're correct, Luis Preciado, he is actually representing Midpen Housing. So Mr. Luis, uh, I am unmuting your microphone. You'll have up to three minutes to uh, provide comments to the commission. 
thank you. Good morning, commissioner, commissioners and Mr. Joe Serrano and staff. Um, my name is Luis Preciado. I am the project manager for BIPIN Phase 2. And uh, Juana Carmen, our director of housing development, is joining us as well. I want to take a moment to um, thank you on behalf of Midpen Housing Corporation. We would like to thank and express our gratitude for your support, partnership, and consideration of our proposed affordable housing development, BIPIN Phase 2. Especially to Mr. Joe Serrano for all his guidance as we prepare our extraterritorial service application. Pippin Phase 2 is a partnership between the City of Watsonville, the County of Santa Cruz, and Midpen Housing Corporation. Pippin Phase 2 is the continuation of the successful construction of Pippin Orchard's apartments, uh, 46 units in Watsonville, which also went through the LAFCO process. Uh, Pippin Phase 2 consists of 80 new affordable homes for low income. Families earning between 30 to 60 percent of the area medium income of the 80 units. Uh, 39 units are set aside for farm worker families. 15 units are set aside for special needs population, and the remainder of the units for the general population. MIPEN looks forward to continuing our successful partnership and collaboration in developing 80 new housing opportunities for our community. Thank you again for all your support and Please let me know if you have any questions for us. Thank you. Great, thank you. Are there any other members of the public who would like to comment on this item? If so, now is the time to uh, call in or raise your hand. You can do so by pressing star nine on your phone. And chair, and I do not see any other requests to address the commission at this time. Okay. With that, I'll close out public comment and I'll bring it back. Um, I'd like to ask uh, the executive officer of staff to receive any written comments um, on this item. Uh, just for clarification, Chair, we have not received any uh, written comments on this item as well. Okay. With that, I'd like to open it up to uh, the commissioners to see if anyone has any questions or comments on this item. Commissioner Anderson. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, how many units are were in phase one? I've forgotten that number. I assume this 80 is for phase two uh, alone. I'm gonna to defer to Mr. Luis because I don't know the number off the top of my head. Luis, do you remember the number of units for phase one? Yes, I do. Uh, the number of units at phase one was 46 units. And the 80 are the proposed 80 units for Pippin phase two, which is the development being proposed today. So the total will be then 46 plus 80, so 126 units, is that correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Luis. Thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Banks and then Commissioner Hunt. Thank you, Chair. Um, the question I have has to do with uh, Atkinson Lane, and I, I know that there are uh, additional residential units in the development, if not actual construction phase beginning. I'm wondering if there is, are plans to improve Atkinson Lane um, for, to contemplate the increased traffic flow that will occur, or how will that be addressed? Uh, Commissioner Ed Banks, uh, good question. And I believe the environmental impact report addresses a number of factors, including uh, transportations and the impacts on Atkinson's lanes. I don't know the specifics if they are uh, going to implement mitigation to improve uh, the street. Um, Mr. Oh, so I'm going to defer to Mr. Luis if he has the specifics, uh, if there's any potential improvements by the city or by the applicant as part of this proposal. Yes, uh, <clears throat> the primary access to the proposed development is going to be through Brewington Avenue. Um, so there's no access through uh, to this proposed development through Atkinson Lane. We do have some um, um, traffic uh, mitigation, counting, counting mitigation measures that we need to implement along um, Crestview and, um, and, and that's about it. But uh, yeah, uh, it's not, Access will not be through Atkinson Lane. Thanks for the clarification. Okay, Commissioner Hunt and then Commissioner Estrada. 
Thank you, Chair. I'd like to ask Mr. Serrano or Mr. Preciado um, if the Pippin 2 is adjacent to Pippin 1 geographically. Uh, yes, they are. Um, I can see um, Pippin. Uh, I'm trying to see that image on 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 the on the screen right now. Uh, if you just right there, that that is Pippin uh, Pippin Orchards or Pippin Phase One, and the area highlighted in red is Pippin uh, Phase Two. So they are immediately adjacent to each development. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. All right, uh, Commissioner Estrada. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Preciado, I had a question about uh, the delays in Pippin Phase 1. Uh, I know that uh, before annexation, uh, the timeline was sort of stretched a little bit because of delays. And I, I was just sort of curious as to know what kind of delays uh, you had. Hello. Commissioner Estrada, is it the question for Pippin, the delays at Pippin phase one, correct? Correct. Over the delays? correct. Yeah. So they had to do primarily with our funding um, or success in acquiring the funding uh, necessary to um, close construction and uh, construction financing and ultimately begin construction. So that was the main reason for the delay at that development. Okay. And you, you don't expect any delays for Pippin phase two, right? Well, we are, uh, are, um, are obviously working on um, <laughs> uh, securing all the financing necessary for this project. And uh, we're tracking some um, uh, funding sources um, that uh, will help us um, with the, um, securing the construction financing for this development, as well as attracting a, an investor for our um, housing tax credits. Um, so it, it is, uh, we have a plan and we, we hope that um, that we don't um, find any significant barriers or delays on, on this development um, once we you know once we identified all the funding sources and we are able to commit them. Uh, understood. Thank you, Mr. Preciado. And then so ideally or realistically, uh, when are we looking at uh, a potential annexation annexation of uh, Pippin phase two? Does, does Mr. Serrano or Mr. Preciado sort of have a timeline in their head? Sure. Um, <clears throat> we are expecting to, if, if everything goes well with our anticipated financing plan, um, it's very competitive, but want everybody to know, so it's a very competitive environment and we also need to find an investor. But if everything goes well, we are planning to uh, begin construction um, in early 2023, and it's an 18-month um, construction schedule. Construction completion is expected. Um, summer of 2024. So based on the recommendation, then, you know, we would be able to complete the annexation within the within one year from securing the last certificate of occupancy. And I'll just add on that, uh, Commissioner Estrada, with phase one, uh, we did this two part process of approving the ESA and then a subsequent annexation. When we uh, added a condition, and this is again, back in 2014, we put a two year uh, deadline of annexation in two years, but as you mentioned, uh, unanticipated changes or challenges happen. And so that's the reason why the commission had to approve extensions to that annexation. So th that was lessons learned. So mm -hmm. this time around uh, LAFCO staff coordinated with the city and the applicant to see what's what's a more realistic timeframe because we do want this to be annexed uh, into the city. It's in the sphere. Uh, the city and the applicants are open to that. So we came to the conclusion that once it's developed uh, within a year of the final occupancy, that's uh, an appropriate time. So that can be within two years or three years, but we don't put that two year limit uh, on them, but it's, it's, it's a little bit more fluid, but at the same time, there's still uh, the understanding that it'll be annexed in the foreseeable future. I appreciate that uh, clarification, Mr. Serrano. And uh, those are my questions, Chair, thank you. All right, thank you. And I had a follow-up question that I'm just curious, um, you know, when these um, annexations are delayed, what are the impact, are there any impacts on um, the jurisdictions that are engaging in these agreements or how, like, 
I guess really trying to get to, you know, with these timelines for annexation, you know, if there are, if there are delays, are there, what are the impacts just so that we have an understanding of so great question, uh, Chair Cummings. What, what I, um, to clarify those type of, of inquiries is to have a resolution. Since uh, my arrival, uh, my, I've implemented a principle that's I think simple but effective is if LAFCO, if the commission requires action, then a resolution is required. So th by having it in writing and having a resolution saying that an annexation needs to occur by this time frame. Uh, then it, it, everyone is on the same page, and there's a, it's a binding agreement. So to answer your question about what's uh, the repercussions of we not meeting that deadline, it, it, it gives us a, a time frame to follow. Uh, and the commission uh, in the past has provided extensions uh, because you know things can happen and things can uh, can be brought up. But the goal is to annex this area. So. The language that we use to have the final, uh, within one year, the final occupancy gives that flexibility to the applicant and to the city, but ultimately it needs to be annexed. And, and, but one remedy is if more time is needed, the commission, this can be brought back and the commission can give further extensions. But uh, I think this uh, language in the resolution allows the flexibility for the city and for the applicant. Does that, does that answer your question, Chair? I think in part, but I'm just kind of curious, you know, so if the process for annexation is like takes longer time, does that mean that the city of Watson Mill is not receiving the fees for water service or, you know, what are, what are some of the, the impacts of not having that agreement go through? So that's, a, so that's a great question. So as part of the extraterritorial service agreement, this allows the city to provide services to the area. Uh, so, uh, Theoretically, they, they can provide services to the location now if the commission approves this ESA. So the, the services and the fees are already gonna be implemented, um, but we wanna reflect that the city's providing that service. So that's why we want that annexation to occur. So if that occurs in two years or three years, or et cetera, we wanna reflect that the city is providing services to this area. And the best way of doing it is adding it or annexing it into the city limits. Got it. That, thank you. That that helps clarify everything. And then I have one uh, follow-up question that's related. Just looking on this map, it seems like um, you know the the parcel that's in red is likely going to become green, you know, as it's uh, incorporated into the city of Watsonville. And I'm just curious about this square. You know. I'm sorry, Chair. I, I, I did not hear. I, I don't know if I'm having technical issues, but I did not hear your your question. So I was. My question was about the this parcel that's kind of looks like it's going to be floating in a sea of green. And will we expect, um, you know, that to come to us in the future, or is that not going to be in, incorporated into? So that right, is a, that's a great on. question. That's a great question. And that's something that will be brought up as part of the annexation application uh, of including, uh, and I have my mouse over, mm -hmm. are, you, are you referring to this section right here? Correct. Yes, and I believe if I'm not mistaken, uh, Mr. Luis, uh, this is also owned by Mid Penn Housing. I, 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 I could be wrong, but this should ultimately be annexed into uh, the city as well. And that can be part of the anticipated annexation uh, involving Mid Penn, but that's something that needs to be addressed because you're right, it'll be substantially surrounded by the city and it would just make sense. It would, have, it would be like a donut hole. So it would be, make sense to include that parcel. Great, and it looks like Mr. Preciado has his hand raised. Go ahead, like Mr. Luis. On this. Yeah, so I just wanted to clarify that uh, partial is actually owned by pg and &E. They have a, a, a substation that they operate out of that um, parcel. Um, yeah, it is not owned by MedPen. Uh, okay. So they, they would have to, I guess, be part of that conversation later on and whether or not they, they would be required to consider annexation or not, but um, it's not related to uh, our development. Right, and, that, and that's a, a discussion where uh, 
we, we can discuss with the city and the applicant of including that parcel or having a subsequent annexation separate from their application. Th th that can be addressed, but you're, you're absolutely right, Chair. That should be, uh, especially if, if the parcel owned by MidPen Housing for phase two is annexed, then we have a situation where we, we create an island and, and, and I, I don't think that's the intent of the commission or the city or the applicant. So that's something that we can rectify. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Roger Anderson. Yes, I a uh, couple of questions. First of all, is when would the actual water service be provided? Is that at the time of construction, occupancy, uh, shivel of funding? Uh, just in general, when would Watsonville actually have to formally um, propose to offer the service? The other thing is that on some of the maps in our packet, there look like there's some environmental impacts on this uh, parcel, which is up for uh, consideration today. And what I'm curious about is, uh, is, are those maps still valid? I think they were done back with phase one. And are there any restrictions on what MidPen will be able to do because of that? So, good question, uh, Commissioner Roger Anderson. The, the, the can you repeat the first question? Because I have the answer for the second, but I want to make sure I address the first the, one. The first question was, I was curious about whether there are any environmental effects, uh, which are indicated on some of the earlier maps. And they kind of carve out the sort of south southwest corner of this proposed parcel. Right. And I'm just curious whether um, those environmental maps are still what are, are guidance for the project or has something changed? That, that's a good question, and I, I will defer to Mr. Luis, but I, I think that they are some mitigated efforts because the areas uh, just uh, west of the parcel is farmland that's still being, uh, that's active. Uh, there may be some type of uh, buffer, like a ag buffer, so that they could uh, minimize uh, mm -hmm. any environmental impacts to the existing farmlands adjacent to it. Uh, but uh, I believe the EIR and the maps uh, may be updated, but I would defer to uh, Mr. Luis if that's going to occur, if those maps are going to be updated or not. Was there another question, uh, uh, Commissioner Anderson, that you well, had? Just the, the timing of when the water service would actually begin. Perfect. Uh, so th this is where uh, the, the chicken and the egg happens with, with LAFCO sometimes with, with cities is Watsonville re re requires it, LAFCO approval before they could provide services to uh, a particular land owner. So uh, assuming the commission approves this ESA, this allows Watsonville and the applicant to uh, do the, the next steps of uh, connecting and and that's a uh, that's I don't have the time frame because I it, it really uh, varies on the proposal, the location, where is the nearest main line, the construction for that. So I don't have the exact time frame, uh, but I'll defer to Mr. Luis for that as well if, if he has an idea of when water and sewer will be, will be provided to uh, the proposed development. Yeah. Um, the water services and sewer services will occur. Uh, prior occupancy. So the, the, the infrastructure will be installed during construction and actual services will be um, delivered just prior occupancy. And on the second question about the, the maps uh, and environmental, um, I'm not sure which, which map, um, but um, um, Mr. Anderson is referring to, but um, I want to say the environmental impact report and the addendum to the environmental impact report, those are the current documents uh, for this development. And the only document is that I want to say that were updated um, for our site is the actual site plan and uh, the delineation of the wetland buffer. So that's, that's the, and the agricultural buffer that Mr. Serrano referred to. So our development and any improvements on this um, proposed development, just like Pippin or just apartments, they will be outside of the 50 foot buffer. So, um, so there is um, a 50 foot buffer for the, to protect the habitat. It is immediately adjacent to the actual wetland. 
I, I hope that that answers your question. Uh, but if there is a, a particular map um, in the report that um, you want, want to point it out for me, uh, I, can, I, I can review and, and address, address it. No, I don't have any um, a reference to the map right now, but I did notice one when I was reviewing the packet. But it sounds like everything, the existing EIR on the, on the total project probably supersedes something as important as environmental constraints. So, and the other thing I've seen to recall was that we considered some of those long, some of the parcels are where there would be in phase one where parking would allow was partly, I think, arranged to, to handle um, or a, a provide an addition to the uh, general setbacks and buffers that were required. Am I correct on that? And I don't recall the history uh, of what occurred uh, off the top of my head, uh, Commissioner Anderson of, of phase one. It's okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Jim Anderson. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question. I'm assuming that the yellow <laughs> parcels are in the county and not in the city. Yes, so the, the parcels shown in the yellow, yellow beige color are, are county land. So uh, these are unincorporated areas. And the areas in green is the city of Watsonville. And the area in question, uh, Nip and Housing's uh, parcel is the red hash mark area. Okay, so then PG&E would have some conversation about whether they wanted to be annexed. And I would think that the tax rate uh, between the city and the county may be different and they want to, since it's a substation, they probably uh, don't have water or sewer there. So they would be most interested in where their lowest tax rate is, I would guess. Right, we would definitely include them in the discussion and ask whether or not they're open to annexation. Uh, and if, uh, you know, ideally we, we don't want to just leave them out, out uh, surrounded by the city of Watsonville, but that they definitely have to be in the discussion. and. We'll, staff will definitely reach out to them when, once we get reached to that point. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Seeing no further questions from commissioners, uh, I'd like to ask if uh, a motion can be made on the staff's recommendation. I'll move the recommended uh, action. Second. Okay, so, uh, I didn't catch who seconded that. I believe that was Francisco. Okay, so we have a motion by Commissioner Jim Anderson, seconded by Commissioner Estrada. And with that, we'll go ahead and take a roll call vote on the item. Yes. Thank you, Chair Cummings. Chair Cummings. Aye. Vice Chair Lather. Commissioner Lather, you're still muted. Yes, <laughs> I double muted myself, sorry. That's fine, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Anderson, Jim Anderson, I'm sorry. Aye. Commissioner Roger Anderson. Aye. Commissioner Ryan Coonerty. Aye. Commissioner Francisco Estrada. Aye. And Commissioner Zach Friend. Aye. For the record, this motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move on to our next item of business, which is service and sphere review for the city of Scotts Valley. The commission will consider the adoption of a service and sphere of influence review for the city of Scotts Valley. And with that, I will turn it over to staff for a presentation. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the city of Scotts Valley is a small community uh, encompassing about five square miles, and it's located uh, at, the, at the center of the county. The attached service and sphere review provides a detailed snapshot of the city's performance during the last six years. For purposes of this presentation, I will summarize our key findings. First, as you see on the screen, the city serves approximately 12,000 residents 
uh, based on staff's analysis and the anticipated slow growth for the city, uh, LAFCO anticipates the population to still be under 13,000 by the year 2040. Next is that the city has been facing some financial constraints over the years. The city's operations can be categorized into two activities, government and business. Our analysis shows that the city's business activities, which is involving wastewater and recreation services, that's been running in the red uh, each year since 2015. And that results in an overall deficit for the city in the last five of the last six fiscal years. However, that does lead to my next finding, which the city has recently <clears throat> implemented a new wastewater rate structure to address this fiscal gap of incoming revenue with actual expenditures. It is also LAFCO staff's understanding that the city will present a new rate study to their city council next month. Our next finding uh, is involving how water is provided to the city of Scotts Valley. Currently, there are two water districts providing water to the residents. The primary provider is Scotts Valley Water District, but San Lorenzo Valley Water District also provides a portion to the city, specifically the Whispering Pines area and Mount Hermon Road. Our next finding shows that there are also two supervisorial districts uh, encompassing the city of Scotts Valley. Based on the last two findings, it may be beneficial for LAFCO to coordinate with the city and the affected agencies to determine whether, is there a benefit in having one water district or having one supervisorial super district rather than two or the status quo? Uh, I think it's, it's timely to have that discussion. And finally, the city sphere is currently larger than the city's jurisdictional limits. Uh, as you are aware, the sphere boundary is a planning tool which indicates areas that should be annexed into the city in the foreseeable future. Uh, as the map shows on your screen, there are 11 areas encompassing, or in 11 areas that has around 500, 500 acres. It would be up to the city and the affected residents if and when these areas are annexed if desired. But based on our analysis, these findings, Staff is recommending that the commission find that this service and sphere review report is exempt from CEQA, find that this report fulfills the requirements uh, for government code section 56425 for sphere determinations and 56430 for service determinations. And finally, staff is recommending that the commission uh, adopt the draft resolution for this report with the following conditions. We reaffirm the city sphere, so no change for the sphere of influence. Uh, you direct staff to coordinate with the city to analyze how water is provided and also coordinate with the two water districts. Direct staff to coordinate with the city and the two super supervisorial districts, uh, specifically District 1 and District 5. Uh, there is a, there, there's discussion about redistricting uh, this year. So again, it's timely to have these discussions. LAFCO staff th does not oppose the status quo uh, but it, it's always a good, a good time to see if there's more efficient ways of providing services or representation. And finally, uh, staff is recommending as part of this resolution to direct staff to provide copies of the service review to not only the city, but to the two water districts, the board of supervisors and any affected or interested agencies. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions once you open and close public comments. Great, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, before we open it up to live public comments, I'd just like to ask if there were any uh, written comments that were received by the LAFCO staff on this item. Great question, Chair, and we have not received any email, any email correspondence for this item. Okay, um, I'd like to then open it up to public comment. So if there's any members of the public who would like to comment on this item, now is the time to raise your hand and you can do so by pressing star nine on your phone. Um, once your hand has been raised, you'll be acknowledged by the staff and you will have up to three minutes. We do have a request uh, and I believe this is a representative from the city of Scotts Valley, uh, Mr. Taylor Bateman. Mr. Taylor, you have been unmuted. 
<clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, good morning. Good morning. This is Taylor Bateman from the city of Scotts Valley. Um, just wanted to say thank you to Joe and staff for a, a great um, review process here. It was great to meet Joe and to work with him on this process. So just wanted to say that and I'm here if there's any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing uh, no further questions or hands raised by members of the public to comment on this item, I'd like to bring it back to the commission for any questions, comments, uh, action and deliberation. So are there any commissioners who have questions on this item? Commissioner Roger Anderson. Yeah, a uh, couple of things. I used to live in Scotts Valley and it's nice to see this report. They've come a long ways, in my opinion, from where we were at that time. Now, the uh, I do have a few questions, though. I'm curious, first of all, how many people live in the non-annex parts of the um, sphere of influence? I noticed that most of it is owned very low density by the county, uh, and I don't know how much of it is actually occupied. So that is one question that uh, I'd be curious in getting an answer for. And it depends a little bit about whether these are built out, whether they're going to be service things about fire and police and other sorts of protection uh, that would obviously have to be considered, I think, before we could do the annexations. Um, another thing I'm curious about is the property tax share that the city of Scotts Valley gets. I know that this was a, a big problem in that since it's a general law city, it tended to get a relatively small fraction of its property tax that was raised within the jurisdiction. So I would be curious to know what that finding is at this time and what workarounds with vehicle license fees and other things have been used to try to straighten that out. The, um, the other thing I wanted to do was to uh, mention that I've always been very impressed with our sewer um, facilities in Scotts Valley. They have true tertiary treatment, which is very, very good allows them to use recycled water, as they say, for almost every possibility that they want. Um, unfortunately, their rates have not kept up, and I hope that that increases they've done in recent years will actually continue to take care of that problem. Um, the other comments are some of the recommendations that Mr. Serrano has made. Uh, the first one is the question of the um, combining uh, the, making one supervisor district. Now, there were a lot of people in Scotts Valley that I knew that liked the idea of having two, both for political things, they didn't want much to do with Santa Cruz. And the other thing was that they thought it'd be better to have two supervisors that would allow the voice of Scotts Valley to be more likely heard. And so this was another thing which, uh, uh, I don't know how it'll come out what the present Scotts Valley uh, inclination is, but I assume that uh, Mr. Serrano has talked to people that are, are willing to consider this particular uh, thing. And then the, um, uh, the, other, the other question is that I was very pleased to see that there's a two and a half million dollar capital budget uh, item for sidewalks within, within Scotts Valley. And again, when I lived there, it was, uh, there was a, mantra that we were going to have a rural um, in, in rural if, environment in Scotts Valley and clearly with more sidewalks that is a big change in my opinion so thank you thank you commissioner anderson uh, i do want to um, address your comments and and questions first is uh, the number of people that live in these 11 unincorporated areas uh, for purposes of, it, it, it's difficult to capture the population of unincorporated uh, communities. Um, AMBAG, who, who does the population forecast, typically uh, provide population numbers for uh, public agencies like cities. Uh, for special districts and unincorporated areas, LAFCO staff needs to do that type of analysis. Uh, so in this draft service review, we identify the acreage for these uh, 11 unincorporated areas and we identify the land use determinations because that information is available. And uh, all 11 are zoned as residential. Some are mountain residential. 
uh, rural residential. So there are residents living there, but to answer your question of how many uh, residents live in each particular area uh, identified in the SIRSU, I do not have that number uh, available. The next is about the two supervisorial districts. When I conduct these, uh, our evaluation, I, I, I like to just look at the, the scope of the city. And it, I found it interesting that the two districts split the city of, of Scotts Valley uh, in half. And the, the county is currently talking about redistricting. So I, I just felt that this was a good opportunity to point this out. There may be, a, there, there may be benefits of having two uh, board of supervisors representing uh, these areas instead of one. Uh, I don't oppose the status quo, but since it's already being discussed, I wanted to uh, highlight this. And if, if the status quo makes sense, um, then that's fine. But I just wanted to uh, highlight this and uh, have a better understanding of why uh, it's currently established that way. But, but staff does not have a position of either way. I just wanted to point it out as part of this review. Great. Thank you for those questions and, and, and thank you for those comments. Are there any other commissioners who have questions on this item at this time? I had one question. I was just curious. I've, I've actually attended a couple of the meetings uh, between Scotts Valley and San Lorenzo water districts. And I know that it's a pretty controversial topic, um, but I was just curious about uh, the timeline. So should, because uh, because part of this is, is related to, um, you know, the consolidation of those two water departments. So what would the timeline and process be for a potential consolidation of those two water districts and what's the role of LAFCO in that process? Great question, Chair. Uh, so there is no set timeline. There are some legal uh, statutory requirements, uh, deadlines that we have to follow. But with, when it comes to consolidation, it is a multi-year effort. And at this moment, uh, the two water districts are simply looking at exploring the idea of consolidation. Uh, it's my understanding that Scotts Valley Water District uh, took action on this item and indicated that they, they are willing to look into consolidation if and only if San Lorenzo Valley Water District uh, does the same. So assuming that San Lorenzo Valley Water District's board tomorrow at their board meeting um, take action to explore, not to initiate, uh, not to uh, start uh, the process, just to explore the benefits uh, and or constraints of consolidation, that, that allows them to have further discussions at the staff level uh, from both water districts. So in theory, assuming both water districts want to explore the idea of consolidation, I have uh, presented to both boards and I've indicated the next step would be to do some do your due diligence of mm -hmm. looking into what are the pros and cons of consolidation, <clears throat> sharing that information with both districts. And that one way of doing that is by uh, developing a ad hoc or a stakeholder group and at a staff level, just sharing the, the your, your findings of consolidation. Like here are our concerns. Uh, do we have the same uh, pension obligations? Do, uh, how many employees do we have? What's the board composition going to be if we do move forward with this? So those are the type of questions that they should have. One other thing that they should do at this in initial or preliminary stage is perhaps hire an outside consultant to do a feasibility study. It's one thing for you to gather the information and, and say, you know, this makes sense. But it's another when you have a third party that's unbiased that will mm -hmm. give you the facts that if you consolidate, these are the benefits these are the constraints. And then the two water district can take that study and they can share it with their residents and determine, should we move forward with consolidation? Yes or no. And again, that is continue to have conversations with not only the two districts, but with the residents. And assuming that all that is done and assuming consolidation makes sense, that's when LAFCO can come in and they can submit an application. But again, it typically takes a year to do this initial uh, exploration of consolidation. And then it takes about another year to actually go through the LAFCO process. And fortunately, we just completed a fire consolidation. So that can be a model. And that took several years 
So a consolidation is not going to happen overnight. And that's one of the misconceptions that residents have is, you know, this is going to happen and, and my property taxes are going to go up or we're going to lose our community identity. It, you really need to have those discussions with your residents early uh, before you even start talking about uh, initiating consolidation. So this is way outside the scope of this service and sphere review, but I think it's a good opportunity to, to kind of clarify that. And to answer your question, uh, Chair, it's a multi-year effort. Uh, and it's a, it's a multi-year effort by the districts, their boards, their staff, and the residents. Thank you. And then I have one follow-up question. Uh, based on the meetings that you've participated in, um, is there any indication as to why this conversation is happening now? And has this conversation come up in the past? So good question. And based on my understanding is... Always the, the water districts or not even water districts, just special districts and cities in general always look for efficiencies. And consolidation is just another tool to improve efficiencies. And the two water districts have a good working relationship. They already have a strategic partnership and they work together when it makes sense. So the idea of uh, consolidation is not new. Uh, and I think for the fact that we saw such a success with the fire consolidation, Consolidation is going to be talked about by agencies, not only in this county, but around the state, uh, because a lot of agencies are struggling and these are challenging times. And that's when consolidation is talked about. And I think that's why the water districts are, are discussing it. Should, does consolidation make sense for our residents? Does it benefit our residents? And I think they've always had that discussion. And I think they reached to the point where Let's, let, let's bring this to our boards and let's talk about this with our residents. And so they, they've just taken the first step of, instead of just having it as a concept to actually look into it in more detail. Great, So I, so I think it's, it's just been a, a discussion point for the two water districts and, and now they just <laughs> wanna take that extra step of exploring the actual benefits and our constraints. Great, thanks for that feedback. Uh, Commissioner Jim Anderson. Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, uh, I know Zach and, and myself and Roger went through the consolidation between the San Lorenzo Valley Water and Lompico, and um, there was a lot of dissension, um, probably more so from the Lompico people, but they really need, in that particular case, it was really evident that they needed San Lorenzo's resources and water. Um, but if you listen to the uh, social media and the groundswell in the valley, um, there doesn't seem to be anybody that I've heard so far that's contacted me that's even wants to talk about it. So this could be one of the things, as Joe said, uh, it could be a long time before or if ever that they get to filing with LAFCO. And that was one of the questions in one of the meetings that the public asked of Mr. Serrano was, have you ever turned down uh, um, a consolidation? And Joe uh, aptly communicated that um, no we haven't but that's because a lot of them never get to an application so um, this one could be quite a while I would think thank you great thank you for that feedback uh, are there any other commissioners who'd like to comment on this item okay hearing none I'd like to ask uh, if there's a commissioner who would be willing to make a motion on this item. I'll move, I'll move approval. I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion by Roger Anderson to move the staff's approval, seconded by Commissioner Jim Anderson. And I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Yes, thank you. Chairperson Cummings. Aye. Vice Chair Rochelle Lather. Aye. Commissioner Jim Anderson. Aye. Commissioner Roger Anderson. Aye. Commissioner Ryan Coonerty. Aye. Commissioner Francisco Estrada. Aye. Commissioner Zach Friend. Aye. For the record, this motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to our next item of business, uh, employee performance evaluation. The commission will consider adjusting staff salary. And at this point in time, I'll turn it over to um, our staff for a presentation. 
Thank you, Chair. I don't have a presentation per se. Uh, each year, the commission conducts a performance evaluation for staff. Uh, the, this commission had a closed session and reviewed the performance evaluation documentation uh, and determined that a salary increase was warranted. So staff is presenting a draft resolution reflecting the commission's discussion. Uh, and staff is recommending that the commission approve the resolution, uh, but I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. But Chair, that concludes my presentation. Um, and I have no further information to share. All right, thank you very much. Uh, at this moment, I'd like to open it up to members of the public. So if there's any members of the public who would like to comment on this item, uh, now's the time to call in if you haven't already. And once you've joined the meeting, or if you are currently in the meeting, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will be given three minutes uh, on to comment on this item. And Chair, I do not see any requests uh, on Zoom and we have not received any emails regarding this agenda item. Okay. With that, I'd like to bring it back to the commission for any questions, comments, action or deliberation. I would like to move the staff recommendation. I'll second. Okay, so we have a motion um, by Commissioner Roger Anderson to move the staff recommendation seconded by Commissioner Friend. Um, if there's no further questions or comments, I'd like to ask the clerk to call a roll call vote on this item. Yes, thank you so much. Chairperson Cummings. Aye. Vice Chair Lather. Aye. Commissioner Jim Anderson. Aye. Commissioner Roger Anderson. Aye. Commissioner Ryan Coonerty. Aye. Commissioner Francisco Estrada. Aye. Commissioner Zach Friend. Aye. For the record, this motion passes unanimously. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next item on other business is special district elections update. Commission will receive a status update on two district related elections. And with that, I'll turn it over to staff for a presentation. All right, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll keep this brief. Uh, the law requires LAFCO to help when there's a vacancy uh, involving special districts. Uh, we did have a vac we do have a vacancy coming up for the commission involving the two uh, special district seats on LAFCO. Uh, Earlier uh, this year, we solicited calls for nominations and for the LAFCO vacancies. We only received two applications for each seat uh, in accordance to state law. If we receive an application for that vacancy seat, um, um, an election is not required. Uh, so in lieu of an election, uh, Jim Anderson and Ed Banks have been appointed to our LAFCO board for this upcoming May. They'll be seated in May. Same thing happened with this uh, redevelopment oversight uh, consolidated board. Uh, the county indicated to LAFCO staff that there was an upcoming vacancies and they were looking for a regular and alternate seat. So it was uh, deja vu. We sent out uh, calls for uh, applications. We only received two applications, one for each seat. So in accordance to state law, we uh, did not have to do an election. And so Jim Anderson and uh, Ed Banks will be the regular and alternate on the RDA Consolidated Oversight Board as well. Uh, again, this was advertised to all the special districts. Uh, we just happened to get two applications from the same individuals, and they were the only ones that were interested. So I don't know if it's a good thing or not, but they are, uh, you know, representing the special districts on those uh, boards. So with that, that, that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Um, at this moment in, moment in time, I'll open it up to the floor for public comment. Uh, so have we received any written comments or requests to address the commission on this item? Uh, Chair, we have not received any written or uh, requests on Zoom to address the commission at this time. Okay. And seeing no hands in our attendees, um, I'd like to bring it back to see if there's any questions or comments uh, from commissioners. 
Okay, seeing no um, questions or comments from commissioners, um, well, I'll just like to welcome back um, commissioners Ed Banks and Jim Anderson to these positions. And given that this is a, um, that we don't have to take action on this item, we'll go ahead and move on to our next item of business. Great. And so our next item of business is a legislative update. And so the commission will receive a status update on LAFCO related legislation. And with that, I'll turn it back over to staff for the presentation and update. Thank you, Thank you Chair. I'll keep this brief as well. The new legislative session is underway. At this time, Cal LAFCO and your staff are currently tracking 17 LAFCO related bills. Uh, one item that we're also tracking is the omnibus bill. Cal LAFCO is sponsoring this omnibus bill, which is uh, intended to focus on minor non-controversial edits to the Cortese Knotts Hertzberg Act or what we know as the LAFCO law. Uh, one area that they will be looking into as part of the omnibus bill is removing obsolete provisions. And there are actually two obsolete provisions involving Santa Cruz County. These have been uh, inactive for over 10 years. Uh, so Cal LAFCO is recommending removing all these obsolete provisions. Uh, I did reach out to the city that it involved uh, and they spoke with their legal counsel. They didn't have any issues removing uh, these obsolete uh, provisions. Uh, so once that omnibus bill is, has its, its title and bill number, uh, I will present it to the commission. And speaking of the omnibus bill, that workload is spearheaded by Cal LAFCO's executive director, which is Pamela Miller, and a LAFCO liaison. And that's typically one of the 58 executive officers. And that role is typically for two to three years. Sam Martinez, who is the San Bernardino LAFCO, has been doing it for three years now, and he's ready to uh, pass the baton. And just recently, Cal LAFCO has selected, appointed uh, me to be the new LAFCO liaison. I have accepted because I think it for, for two reasons. One, it gives uh, us more exposure to Cal LAFCO, but two, it, it really gives us a, a, an opportunity to really be engaged with the legislative efforts and I can relay that information to our commission. So I think it's, it's a win-win and I've been, more, I've been meaning to work closer with Cal LAFCO and this is just a great avenue for me. Um, so that is uh, in the works. So I'm currently in the transition mode with Sam. But Chair, this is an informational item. No action is required, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Um, are there any members of the public who would like to comment on this item? If so, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And I'd also like to ask um, if there have been any uh, written comments or requests to address the commission on this item. Chair, we do not see any requests on Zoom and we have not received any emails uh, on this item. Okay, with that, I'll go ahead and close public comment and I'll bring it back to the commission for questions or comments. Commissioner Roger Anderson. Yeah, uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Joe on this appointment. Uh, it's a real honor to do that. I've known quite a few executive officers who have done this, and it's a great service both to our local LAFCO as well as to the state. I would be curious, though, in finding out from Mr. Serrano uh, what new things he may be interested in pursuing in this position on the Cal LAFCO uh, organization. Well, that, the legislative realm uh, of LAFCO has always interests me uh, just because I haven't had that much exposure. So this was one of the uh, Mount Everest that I've been trying to conquer. Uh, so I don't have any other roles in Count LAFCOs in the works, uh, but this is something that I've been, I've been meaning to, to be a part of. So I'm, I'm really uh, appreciative and uh, I'm looking forward to, to helping Cal LAFCO uh, move forward with any legislative actions. But that, that's the only role that I've been uh, seeing in the horizon. But if you have any other roles that you'd like me to uh, be involved, I'd be more than happy to uh, hear that. Well, we want you to spend enough time up there, but not all your time. No, exactly, I, I, that's one of my things of, uh, I wanna manage my time appropriately. And because I have 
uh, Deborah Means and Chris here, I, I feel more than comfortable to uh, assume this role. But at the same time, I have my priorities here with this commission and I, I can balance that. I feel very comfortable with it. Thank you. Great, are there any other questions from commissioners at this moment in time? Okay, seeing none, uh, there's no action required on this item. So we'll go ahead and move on to our next item, which is written correspondence. And I'll turn it back over to staff uh, for a presentation on this item. Thank you, Chair. I don't have a presentation. This item just uh, reflects two written correspondence that we received. One was Cal Lafco's regular quarterly reports and also an email from Becky Steinbrenner regarding a MOU between UC Davis, Yolo County and the city of Davis. And this is in regards to our discussions about the university and our draft comment letter. So she wanted to provide us more information on what transpired in uh, Yolo County. But this is also an informational item chair. There's no uh, action required, but I'm happy to answer any questions once you open and close public comments. Okay, so at this time, we'll go ahead and open public comment. So if there's members of the public who'd like to comment, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Um, and I'd like to ask the staff if we've received any written comments or requests to ask to address the commission on this item. Chair, we have not seen any requests on Zoom or we, and we have not received any written correspondence uh, for this item. Okay. Um, given that this is a, an update and we don't have to take action on this item, I'll go ahead and move on to the next item on our agenda, which is press articles. And so I'll turn it back over to staff uh, for presentation or updates on this item. And, and I'm sorry, Chair, I did see uh, Roger Anderson's hand uh, for the written correspondence. I'm not sure if, if he still had a, a comment. Oh, apologies. Go ahead, Chairman Anderson. Oh, yes, I'm, uh, I made some remarks at the last meeting they were based on obsolete information, certainly. And I uh, am sorry that that's become an issue, but basically I have looked at the UC Davis agreement with the uh, County of Yolo, uh, and I'm glad to see that they're making progress on what they're actually doing there. Right. Great. My Thank apologies you. for missing that. Um, your hand was up. I thought it was from the, the previous item. the next item and Commissioner Anderson is your hand. Okay, I was just making sure your hand wasn't up. So. <laughs> uh, the next item on our agenda is press articles. And so I'll turn it back over to staff. If there's any presentation or comments on this item? Chair, no presentation. We, we just uh, on a regular basis uh, identify any LAFCO related articles to share with the commission. Uh, as you may have noticed, uh, there's been a lot of uh, talks about the proposed water consolidation. So we've uh, identified a number of articles uh, that are not only local uh, articles, but it even reached uh, San Francisco. So it, it's a topic that it's being discussed around the state. So it's not just these two water districts are, are uh, uh, an outlier. It, it's being discussed all over. And I just wanted to share these articles with you. But this is an informational item. No action is required, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if there's any members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will be given three minutes. And then I'd also like to ask uh, staff if we've received any comments or requests to address the commission on this item. And chair, we have not received any requests via email or on Zoom for this item. Okay, so I'll go ahead and close public comment and bring it back to the commission to see if there's any questions or comments on this item. Okay, hearing none, um, this we do not need to take action on this item. And so we'll go ahead and move on to the last item, which is commissioner's business. And so I'd like to ask if there's any commissioners that have anything that they would like to share or discuss at this moment in time. I uh, actually do have an item um, that I'd like to bring up. At the last Santa Cruz City Council meeting, there was a motion to direct the city's 
LAFCO representative to request that an item be placed on the closed session agenda of the next LAFCO meeting to discuss the lawsuit filed by UCSC over extraterritorial water rights and uh, to see if there can be discussion and possible action during closed section at our next meeting. And so I just wanted to bring that to the commission's attention. And I'd like to ask the commission's attorney, do we need to take a vote to put this on the next agenda or is this something that, um, that I should work with the um, executive officer to put on the next agenda? Yeah, uh, Chairperson Cummings, just work with, with Joe to put it on the agenda. Um, I, I think it's appropriate to ask if anyone has any objections to that, but I think uh, you too can put something like that on the agenda for closed session. Okay, so I'd like to ask if there's any commissioners who have any questions or comments on um, the item that's just been raised. Commissioner Anderson, Roger Anderson. Yeah, I'm just, I'm curious, is, is LAFCO a party to this suit? I assume this is a new suit that you're talking about here. The yes, this I, I've seen about it is a little bit a next door neighbor about it, but that was the only post that I found and I, uh, and I hadn't certainly seen anything to the press. So I'm curious about how involved we are in the suit. I think, um, we want to keep it somewhat simple since this item isn't on the agenda. We, we I think it's it's appropriate to uh, to let you know that LAFCO is not a party to the suit. But uh, as far as discussing any of the details of it, I don't think that's something that we should uh, engage in today. Okay. Are there any other uh, questions or comments from commissioners? Hearing none, um, I will follow up with Mr. Serrano to see how we can get this on the next uh, agenda for closed session. Great. And, and with that, I'll move on to our last item, which is adjournment. And so I'd like to look for a motion to adjourn and would like to let the public know that our next uh, regularly scheduled LAFCO meeting will be on Wednesday, April 7, 2021 at 9 a.m. And so is there a motion to adjourn? I'll move. I'll move. Okay, uh, so there's a motion by uh, Vice Chair Lather. And with that, uh, that will conclude our meeting. So thank you all for joining and we look forward to seeing you all on April 7th for our next LAFCO meeting. Great. Thank you. Justin. Thank, thank you, Chair. You. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Take care, you. everyone. Good Happy job, Chris. Everyone. Thank you. Survived your meeting, your first meeting. Good job, Chris. <laughs> yeah, this was great. Teamwork, thank you. Yay. Thanks, Justin. Thank you, commissioners.